Women Are Tots. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mike Pesco, a tobacco researcher at Georgia State University. TOPS is organized by Xi Sheng from the Ohio State University, Justin White from University of California, San Francisco, Catherine McLean from George Mason University, and me. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will drop from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean from George Mason University to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our fall 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Matthew Stone entitled Evaluating U.S. Smokers' Willingness to Pay for Different Cigarette Packaging Designs Before and After Real-World Exposure in a Randomized Trial. Dr. Matthew Stone is a recently appointed postdoctoral scholar in the Herbert Wernheim School of Public Health and Longevity Science at the University of California, San Diego. He received his doctorate in public health an emphasis in health behavior in the joint doctoral problem program at UC San Diego and San Diego State University, after which he completed a postdoctoral fellowship in tobacco regulatory science at the Penn Rutgers T Cores in the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Nicotine Addiction at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Stone's research focuses on developing measures and utilizing novel methodologies to help elucidate the impact that tobacco regulatory policies have on tobacco regulated cognitions and behavior. His recent work leverages choice-based tasks that mirror real-world decision-making in order to reveal the implicit preferences that consumers have for various tobacco products and their accompanying features, particularly under different regulatory frameworks. Our discussant today is C. Shang, a tobacco researcher at The Ohio State University. Dr. Stone, thank you for presenting for us today. Wonderful, thank you, Catherine. Let me uh, thank you. my slides here. All right. Good morning, afternoon, all. Again, uh, my name is Matthew Stone. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Longevity Science, University of California, San Diego. Um, to start uh, with my disclosures, I've received funding from the NIH, FDA, and TRDRP. Uh, this prop project was supported by an NCI and TRDRP grant. Um, of course, the content is not necessarily uh, the response, it is the responsibility of the authors, but does not necessarily reflect um, the official views of the NIH, FDA, TRDRP. We have also received no funding from the tobacco industry, any advocacy groups, or the pharmaceutical industry, and we have no other financial relationships to disclose. As mentioned before, I'll be presenting a single paper entitled Evaluating Smokers' Willingness to Pay for Differing Path Designs, both before and after a real-world exposure in a randomized trial. And you can find that paper um, published in Tobacco Control. Now, so as you know, the tobacco industry spends tens of billions of dollars annually on marketing and advertising to make their products as appealing as possible in order to retain users and recruit new populations of smokers. Of course, this results in massive morbidity and mortality and, of course, um, loss in productivity, um, both in the U.S. and around the globe. Voluntary restrictions on marketing have been largely ineffective, and the tobacco industry has continuously demonstrated a willingness to circumvent most of these constraints, and thus the governments have needed to enact intervening legislation. Now, and to combat this uh, rising tobacco epidemic, the World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control um, was adopted in 2003. Part of this treaty, um, they set out to really um, ensure that every person be informed of the health consequences, addictive nature, and mortal threat posed by tobacco consumption and exposure to tobacco smoke. Part of this, they recommended large health warning labels for all products, and particularly recommended strong graphic health warning labels. 
Now, 182 countries have ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, but not the United States. To date, we've had over 127 countries implement some form of graphic warning policy that meets the minimum standards set forth in the treaty. 17 countries, however, have gone further and introduced plain packaging, which was pioneered in Australia, which removes all industry marketing and adds these large graphic health warning labels. Now, the U.S. has not been without effort. In 2009, Congress enacted the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act. This gave FDA regulatory authority over all tobacco products, including the manufacturing of this. They were also required um, to implement uh, a, a graphic warning label. And so they did, and they proposed one in 2011. Now, most of you probably know the tobacco industry filed a series of lawsuits, both around the Tobacco Control Act, as well as the graphic warning label requirement. Um, their effort to shoot down the Tobacco Control Act um, was halted as the, the act was deemed constitutional. However, they were successful in striking down the first uh, proposed set of warnings by the FDA. This is back in 2011. Now, FDA um, chose not to take that fight to the Supreme Court. Instead, they decided to do some research um, into uh, a new set of warning labels. Now, this was taking them a little bit of time, so a number of public health groups and organizations filed a lawsuit against the FDA um, as the Tobacco Control Act required warnings. And so FDA was required to do that. In 2020, FDA proposed a new set of graphic warnings. And of course, they are being sued once again by the tobacco industry. Um, but we do have an effective date for the warnings. They're scheduled to go into effect in the U.S. in October 2023. Um, however, this has been the ninth time that's pushed back. Um, now, while the fate of graphic warning labels in the U.S. continues to play out, we know that cigarette packaging contains industry marketing. Um, and the, the warnings on these, these packs, they largely go unnoticed. They're not prominent. They're often color matched to the pack to blend in and making them difficult to see. And moreover, there hasn't been any meaningful change in these warnings in over 55 years. And thus, they've largely not had an effect. Instead, what these packs contain are branding, which captures attention, generates positive affect, and importantly, adds a perceived value to the product. Now, following an incentive salience model, the degree to which smokers are willing to pay for these kinds of designs likely reflects how much the desired drug reward combines with the appealing pack design features. Now, plain or blank packaging can remove the industry's ability to use these appealing marketing features to encourage continued smoking or recruit new smokers. Thus, Removing this imagery from the packaging can weaken this perceived value of the product. Now, graphic warning labels in plain packaging can take this a step further by using salient imagery to remind smokers of the health hazards every time they pick up or display their pack. Adding these large graphic warnings should provoke negative affect, reduce the appeal of the product, and increase the awareness of tobacco-related health harms all of which should combine to further re reduce the perceived value of these products. Now we know that the initial exposure to graphic warnings appears to reduce the smoker's willingness to pay for these products. However, that willingness to pay um, after an extended exposure is likely to be a more important indicator of the ongoing effects of these interventions. Of course, repeated exposure to graphic warning labels may reduce that initial impact leaving smokers kind of emotionally and cognitively desensitized to the imagery. Our measurement of this desensitization comes with its own set of challenges. But one way to examine this desensitization um, can be by measuring the degree to which smokers value such products and how these perceived values change over time. Thus, we set out to examine uh, if exposure to graphic warning labels does generate initial large price aversion valuations like we think it does, and if sustained exposure to graphic warning packaging is associated with a weakening of this kind of price aversion. To do this, we conducted uh, what we called the California Smokers in Australia Randomized Control Trial, 
or the TASA study. Um, this study examined the effects that packaging has on smoking cognitions and behavior after three months of use of differing packaging designs. Um, those designs included um, some of the images I've just shown you, the current US packaging designs, uh, blank pack designs with uh, the marketing materials removed and various sets of rotating graphic warning images. Um, now to examine the willingness to pay for these pack designs, we included a type of discrete choice cigarette purchase task known as an adaptive choice-based conjoint, which I'll get into a little bit, but this was administered at the baseline and end of study. Now, more specifically, the CASA trial recruited um, adults that were 21 to 65 years old who lived in the San Diego or San Marcos metropolitan area. Um, they needed to smoke at least five cigarettes a day, had no intentions to quit smoking, um, had no unstable medical conditions, had an active cell phone plan with text messaging, and were able to purchase two, work, two weeks worth of cigarettes at a time. Now, participants came into our lab for a baseline visit where they were exposed to the different pack designs, allowed to handle them, look at them, and they completed some measures of sociodemographic and tobacco use history. After which, they were enrolled into a one month running period where they purchased cigarette packs directly from us uh, of their own preference and completed weekly measures via their cell phone on tobacco related cognitions and behavior. For those who were able to complete the, the running period, they were randomized um, to one of three conditions. They either continued to purchase their usual cigarettes from the study, or two, they had their cigarettes repackaged into blank packs devoid of industry marketing. Or finally, three, they had their cigarettes repackaged into rotating sets of three graphic warning packs that are currently used in Australia. And finally, they returned to our lab at the end of the study and completed that conjoint trade-off task, our willingness to pay measure um, for the different five designs. Now, the trial consisted of 357 adult daily smokers who were an average about 40 years old, roughly split on gender, and the majority of the sample was predominantly white. Um, most had either attended college or had earned a college degree, and these participants were largely brand loyal and preferred to smoke Marlboro branded cigarettes. They smoked roughly about a half a pack on a day and were moderately nicotine dependent. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, the willingness to pay trade-off tasks we used is known as an adaptive choice-based conjoint analysis. Essentially, what this is, is an experimental market research task that assesses um, hypothetical purchases of differing product designs at various price points. Um, and we'll get into this in, in just a second. I'll show you what this looks like. But by analyzing the choice patterns that consumers make, it reveals the amount of utility that each of these product attributes have. Now, because one of the things we're asking about is price, is we can use that price utility to generate price estimates, which reflect the value that consumers may be willing to pay for the different components of the product, in this case, cigarette packaging. So here we evaluated four different attributes or characteristics of the pack. This is the pack design itself. We had five levels. This was the current US packaging, the blank packaging devoid of marketing, and three differing graphic warning images, including a blindness image, a teeth damage image, as well as a foot gangrene image. We also evaluated the tobacco origin, whether it was domestic, or imported, and whether or not the pack had a quit line number or not. Lastly, we asked individuals how much they paid for an average pack of cigarettes and used that price to vary the choices throughout the task, plus or minus 33% uh, within that initial price that they gave us. Now, because this is a fractional factorial design and we're not able to 
evaluate all combinations of the attributes and levels as it would largely make uh, a quite a burdensome task. Um, we administered um, the conjoint task to about a thousand bots. We had a thousand bots run through various different designs of the task to really get a really efficiently designed task that allowed us to estimate um, with, with minimal time um, each of these different product combinations. So essentially what you're seeing here is that the average number of times each product combination is shown uh, to an individual. Our design had a really good D efficiency, which measures the goodness of fit of our design compared to a hypothetical perfect orthogonal design, which would re result in efficiency of about one. Now let's let's take a moment to see what this task actually looks like. So first we match the task to participants preferred cigarette brand at the average price they paid for a pack of cigarettes. We offered one of four different brand options, American Spirit, Camel, Marble, Newport. Um, but knowing that not all individuals smoked one of these four popular brands, we did ask um, if they preferred another product. If they did, we then asked them which of these four products they preferred the most, and that was the task they were uh, given. Um, we then asked the average price that they paid for a pack of cigarettes. Next, the, the part of the task, um, participants create or design their own pack of cigarettes by selecting from among these attributes that we evaluated. And they're free to change the different levels and they'll see an image of the resulting pack design. Once they're satisfied, they move on to the second step of the task in which we present participants three different pack designs and inquire about the possibility of purchase of these. So as you can see, we have the four different levels and these are varied slightly away from their own preferred product design. And participants go through a series of these tasks and it shows different pack options at different price points. And again, they select if they would or would not buy the resulting product. Ultimately, we get to a kind of choice tournament, um, tournament of champions, if you will. So all of the products that were identified as potential purchase um, options are pitted against one another. And participants, again, are shown three different pack designs at various price points and asked to select which one they were most likely willing to purchase. Um, oftentimes, since we are centering in on where those preferences lie, either one to two differing uh, attributes may be consistent across the pack and are thus grayed out. Now, as a reminder, we administered this conduit task both at the, the front and the end of the intervention. So I should note that we had a slightly smaller end in the main trial. This is partly due to missing data. Um, but one of the other nice features of this task is we're allowed to estimate how consistent individuals are in their pattern of responses, i.e. are they consistently giving us similar information, i.e. I do not prefer the gangrenous foot image. Um, and we can calculate what's known as a, a root likelihood estimate or RLH value uh, at the participant level. This can be compared to those bots that I was telling you about, just responding randomly. Um, we can generate RLH values for those bots. And so for individuals who did not um, have a consistency value that was better than bots responding randomly, which gave us an indication that they might not have been paying attention during the task, were removed um, from the study. Now, I should say, um, we had different set of images that were used in the conjoint task as well as the trial itself. Only one of the three graphic warnings selected for use in the trial um, was used in the conjoint task. The gangrene image was selected for use across both of these tasks, as we found in, in previous work that it provoked the greatest amount of negative affect and was perceived to be the most effective at communicating health risks in a pretest. The throat cancer image was selected for use in the trial as it ranks second on this perceived effectiveness measure um, and first on perceived risk. 
Now the neonatal baby image was selected because smokers with children perceived this to be the most effective at communicating risk. Now the blindness and teeth damage images were selected for use in the conjoint task as they ranked similarly to perceived effectiveness, and they were really used to explore whether the effects of willingness to pay for these pack designs generalizes to graphic warning images as a whole, um, particularly because they're not exposed to these images throughout the trial. So at this point, I would like to take a moment to pause to answer any questions about the study or the parent trial, um, or generally about the conjoint task before I get into the results of the study. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone. This is really fascinating. Uh, I will turn the uh, floor over to our moderator, Dr. C. Shang, but audience members, please remember to put your questions in the Q&A. We'd really love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation on the first part. Um, so I think I have a few questions. Um, some of them are just clarifications. Sure. I guess, you know, the uh, adaptive conjoint based analysis or the tasks are very novel to me. So I'm very curious, you know, how this multiple steps would factor into you like even the ultimate uh, DCE, let's say. So I know there is a step to build your own. And then people will say, oh, this is something, uh, the second task would be like people choosing, uh, this is something that I, I would possibly buy. Mm -hmm. I would not buy at all. So like you get preferences like at each step. So I'm just wondering, so do you mean by conducting that, those steps that everybody would eventually get a slightly different DCE in the lab of step three? Yeah, great question. So actually every individual gets their own um, design DCE that's specific to them. Um, part of the beauty of these adaptive choice-based conjoints um, is their flexibility to evaluate multiple characteristics simultaneously. Um, for this particular task, it's not as relevant, but what it allows is for a large set of options to be evaluated. It would largely be impossible otherwise. You might have a full factorial combination of hundreds of products. And so part of the what the adaptive um, choice-based conjoint does is that first part where they set those preferences, that gives us some information about really what they prefer. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives us a point to kind of pivot around and start exploring different options away from that. So it really allows yeah. for an efficient design to kind of probe um, around those preferences. Um, I'll get into this in a, in a little bit, but we use a type of hierarchical modeling um, to kind of backfill information in the spaces where we're not exactly assessing perfect comparisons. That's part of the mm -hmm. reason we got into um, having a, a, a good balanced design to make sure that we're showing people a broad set of these different options. Yeah, so I really interested in the design. So I guess my next question is also about the design because you have not just prices and also the, the warnings of the, how you present packages as an attribute, but you also have these two other attributes, which mm -hmm. are the quit line numbers and tobacco origin. Uh, another thing that I'm curious about, about the packaging attribute selection is that you guys are not manipulating any like color, right, of the package. So I, I just wonder, I'm wondering like, can you tell us a little bit more about your rationale of picking certain sure. attributes but not others, yep. Absolutely, so two parts to that. One is, um, you know, we included both uh, the quit line number and the tobacco origin. Um, kind of with this idea that we, we didn't assume that these would be major decision points. We really wanted to focus the task and the warning itself, and we weren't as interested, um, if you will, in these other components. And so we needed to include a number of set of options to make these, these packs uh, seem realistic in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. It is part of that, uh, our, choice, um, our choice there. And as far as, uh, can you remind me of the, the second question? Sorry. Oh, uh, I was just curious, like usually when you look at the, some of the packaging, oh, yes, the, the, uh, yeah. the color, right? So yeah, the color, sorry, yes. Yes, yeah. so we, um, we actually licensed the images and the color. So this is the olive Pantone green that was uh, determined to be the most aversive um, pack color, you mm -hmm. know, uh, in existence apparently. 
um, South Australia did a study of this. And we had licensed the set of uh, warnings from Australia at the time of the study. These were um, considered to be the most strong, the strongest warnings currently in use in, in the world. And so we really wanted to focus in on, on that aspect, going to like a maximal point of what would happen here, especially knowing that in the US, um, that it's unlikely we're going to have flame packaging. So we want to understand what the maximum effect would be, assuming mm -hmm. that it would be a, a lot less. Um, we we're doing some other work kind of exploring colors and the effects um, right. in other studies, um, but it's a, it's a good thing to think about. Yeah, so my last question is about uh, at baseline when you're conducting all this um, adapted uh, CBC. Mm -hmm. So is it after you ask the participants to come in like uh, to the, you know, to your lab and play with packages or it was before? It was um, after, yeah. It was after, okay. So we, we brought people in and um, I kind of glossed over this, but we allowed people to explore um, the packages. In fact, we had a very structured think aloud um, task where we exposed individuals to each one of the packs and asked them their th to express their thoughts and feelings and they explored the pack and we, you know, monitored um, their response mm -hmm. and we have some other kind of publications in this area, but we really wanted to give them an opportunity um, to see and feel what, the, what these packs look like. And then it was after that, um, that we allowed them uh, to take this conjoint task or ask them to take this conjoint task. That was by design because we really wanted more than just here's some packs on a screen. We wanted more of a, hey, these are a real world thing that you might be randomized to receive. Thank you. Those are all my questions. I'll pass it to Catherine since there is a Q&A. Yes, thanks so much, C. Those are great questions. Uh, and audience, thank you for your, your questions in the Q&A. Please feel free to enter more. Uh, Dr. Stone, I'll just read a few of these to you and you can uh, please respond as you like. A question from Deborah Ripple. Uh, I think you may have touched on this, but did you need permission to repackage the cigarettes? Ah, yes, so we, we, um, we did. We, received, we reached out to Australia and received um, permission from the Commonwealth of Australia to use um, to use the packs, to use Great, that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a question from Akashia Sarma. Uh, were prices calculated specific to each individual based on their reported average pack price? Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, exactly. So we, we, we asked them initially and we in, pulled that information into the study design. And so the prices that they were seeing throughout the design um, were varied within plus or minus 33%. So there was like a random shock value added mm. uh, to each one of the images that they saw that was centered on that person's particular price point. Great, thank you. And just one more question from uh, Heather Selin. Uh, I have often I have, uh, have often heard public health colleagues say that graphic health warning labels and other gruesome messaging stops working because smokers claim that they simply don't want to look at the image or change the channel. I've always thought this was evidence of effectiveness. If someone takes steps to avoid seeing an aversive image or message, doesn't that show that they were affected by it? What is your opinion? So it's a great question. And um, uh, we're gonna get into some of that. And that's part that what we were, we were interested in looking at. We don't exactly address that here. We do have some other work uh, published about this, about displaying your pack in public and pack hiding. Mm -hmm. um, we do see that there is some indications that people who are exposed to this type of packaging um, do increase their pack hiding over time. Um, but we also see, and we'll see in this study, that there is a desensitization that occurs um, after regular exposure to these images. So the first time you might see it, you're like, ugh. But after the 700th time, it becomes less uh, and just becomes your pack. Um, and so that's part of the underlying question that we're trying to address. Thank you. This is really fascinating. Um, I think we are done with the Q&A, but audience members, please remember to enter more questions or comments. We'd really love to hear from you. And Dr. Stone, please continue with your presentation. Great. Thank you for the questions. All right. So once we administered this, uh, this conjoint task, we then analyze the data. Now to analyze this, we use what's known as a multinomial logit, hierarchical Bayesian estimation, to determine the utility of these product attribute levels using these 40,000 
iterative models. What this does, it allows us to determine the implicit value or the utility that an individual places on different product characteristics. Um, so to kind of draw an analog that's outside of the world of tobacco, if I am in a Ford motor company and I want to sell a new feature in a car, you know, whether it be some sort of fancy, you know, electronic, I want to know how much to charge for that. I might want to run one of these tasks and try to determine how much people are willing to pay just for that component. And so this is what we use um, to do that. These utilities really represent the relative weighted preference for each attribute level combination. This will be a little more clear when I show the data. But we, because we're asking about price, we can generate a dollar per utility um, and, and that is allows us to determine that willingness to pay, not just for the whole product itself, for, for each of those product attributes. We can also then determine how important each one of those attributes are in purchase decisions. So here's what we find. Um, first, overall, basic economic theory holds. Price was the primary driver of purchase decisions. It, it, it comprised about 70% of the decisions that people made throughout the task. Um, and this importantly did not change from you know, the, the baseline to the end of the study. Um, we found though that packaging was the second most important driver of the purchase decision within this space. Um, and that comprised about 24% of the decision at the front end of the study. Um, but after three months, of exposure to the various different designs, we found that the importance of packaging fell by about 2%. So it changed, but not drastically so. Importantly, as I was talking about before, the tobacco origin and the quit line were largely irrelevant to purchase decisions and only comprised about two to 3% of the decisions respectively. We did see a slight increase in the preference uh, or in the importance of tobacco origin at the end of the study with this increase was, while significant, it was only about half a percent. So largely not all that meaningful. So at the baseline, we found um, that smokers were unaware of which arm they were gonna be randomized into the trial. Yet the initial willingness to pay estimates um, differed among the randomly allocated groups. So you can see within the current US PAC, um, the, the group that was most willing to pay for this was the blank pack arm at about $2.22. Um, and this was significantly different than those who were randomized to be in their, receive their own packs or the graphic packs. Uh, similarly, the gangrene packs were, had a, a price aversion to them but this price aversion was differential across the study here. So those in the blank pack arm, um, the most price averse um, to the pack. Uh, nevertheless, when we look across price utilities for the pack designs, that we find that regardless of study arms, smokers were willing to pay approximately $2 more for current US packaging and about $1.50 more um, for blank packaging. One of the things to keep in mind here though, that these are absolute values and they sum up to zero. So if you sum these columns up, they'll add to zero. So the zero point here falls somewhere between the blank and blindness image. And we'll come back to this a little later for ease of interpretation. But the other thing that we see is there's a graded effect um, across the different warnings. Um, that we, we saw that really aligned with the salience of the image. So the least salient of the image was a blindness image. And this generated the, the least amount of price aversion. Contrasted with the gangrene image, um, this uh, was the most price aversive and uh, varied at about negative $2 to $1.50. Now within the own pack arm, we saw minimal change. Um, pre and post intervention. Um, the change that we did see was, was slightly within the teeth damage image and this became slightly more aversive to this group after the end of the trial. 
for those in the blank back arm, um, we saw a change in willingness to pay for the current US packaging. And this fell by about 46 cents after the end of the study. Simultaneously, um, we also saw a change in their valuation of the gangrene pack. And this aversion, while negative, decreased by about 69 cents. Um, so a little over $1.50. However, in the blank, uh, the, those who were randomly assigned to be in the graphic arm of the trial, um, we saw a, a drop in their willingness to pay for both the current US packaging, um, as well as the gangrene packaging, but also the teeth damage. Um, now, importantly, these are from unadjusted models. These are dependent sample t-tests with bootstrap confidence intervals. Um, and we did have this unbalanced uh, groups at the front end of this. And so what we did uh, is we conducted a set of baseline controlled regression models to account for this difference at baseline. And then we examined the post-intervention change and willingness to pay by each of the study arms. And so here's what we found. For the current US PAC, um, we saw that it was only the graphic warning group or the graphic warning arm of the trial that reduced their willingness to pay for the US packaging post-intervention. This willingness to pay dropped um, by about 38 cents. For the blank packs, um, we saw no differences between the study arms. Um, largely, this, this difference uh, was pretty consistent throughout the study as uh, we kind of expected. Now, when we look at the differing pack design options, um, examining this post-intervention change in willingness to pay for the blindness and teeth damage image, we saw no significant change. Um, now, of note, recall that neither the blindness or teeth damage image were included as part of the rotating set of packs that people were exposed to in the graphic warning arm of the trial. Now, however, the foot gangrene pack that was included in the intervention, we did see a weakening of willingness to pay in both the blank pack and graphic uh, pack arms of the trial. And again, recall that this, um, that this initial price utilities um, were negative. And so these values were, were weakened by about 40 to 50 cents. Now, the relative nature of this um, can get a little tricky. So one of the things I like to do is to think about this in this sense. And here we're looking at some data from those just within the graphic warning pack of the trial. So on average, um, smokers, uh, denoted that they were willing, that they paid about $7.57 on average for a pack of marbles. So were the graphic warning pack with the gangrenous foot to be implemented? Well, the question is, well, what would happen to people's preferences for these other pack designs? And what we found is that people would be willing to pay $3.21 more or about $10.78 total um, to get their old pack back. Um, for the blank pack, this was slightly less, but not very much so, of about $10.44 total, or an increased willingness to pay of about $2.87. Now, this is the front end of the trial. After three months of exposure to these packs, to the graphic pack specifically, these weakened. Um, and so, we now see an increase of only $2.45 for their own pack for a $10 total um, and a $2.32 increase or just shy of $10 uh, for the blank pack. So you can kind of see the difference there. So what does this tell us? Um, we know that the most important factor was price. So again, I cannot reiterate enough that basic economic theory holds and price was really the major purchase uh, driver here. Uh, however, this was followed um, by the pack design at about 24%. Generally, US PACs, um, they generated a considerable amount of appeal valuations, um, but this was only slightly higher 
about 40 cents in the blank packs with no marketing. This was pretty consistent um, across all the groups. This price importance um, remained unchanged, uh, but we did see this minimal 2% uh, change in the importance of packaging. And we think this was largely driven by the decreases in willingness to pay um, for the, the graphic packs, as well as the US pack among those in the, the graphic arm of the trial. Um, participants who were assigned to the US PAC, they experienced no significant change um, in willingness to pay. Thus, we think this group really served as both a good test, retest reliability of just the measure itself, um, but it also served as a good anchor and an appropriate control to compare the intervention groups to. Um, now, participants who are assigned to the blank PAC arm of the trial remain unchanged in their willingness to pay for everything but really the gangrenous um, foot. Now, recall that the baseline price aversion for that gangrene patch was really much higher um, in that blank pack arm than either of the other two arms. Um, yet after the intervention, the, the price aversion fell to a rate that was in line um, with the other arms. And we think this might be due to simply just regression to the mean. Um, however, we, we want to examine this in the future. Um, we're, we're really unsure if the packaging devoid of industry marketing, how that really impacts the perceived value um, of, the, uh, of these type of packaging. Um, overall, the impact of graphic warning labels had on the product price perceptions was roughly equivalent to about a $3 egg size tax. Put another way, they would need sizable discounts or be willing to pay about $3 more considering the relative nature uh, for these packs relative to their current US pack. Um, however, were this an actual tax increase, we would expect um, significant short-term change in smoking behavior. Um, now, while we don't have data in this talk, the, the larger randomized trial um, did examine this and we did not see a significant change in uh, smoking behavior uh, across the different arms. Uh, that said, participants who were assigned to the graphic warning pack did experience a weakening in the discount needed to willingly purchase the gangrene pack, suggesting a kind of desensitization or wear out uh, effect after repeated three months exposure of using this, this pack. Um, they certainly, that aversion Valuation became less pronounced over time. Um, and remember that this was uh, included in this rotating set of images. Now, um, the lack of change that we see in the other two packs for the blindness and teeth damage image gives us some sense that this kind of desensitization is not generalized and, and not necessarily occurs in packs that are unseen. Um, so if we were to think about this a little bit, um, uh, it gives us some sense that uh, perhaps in order to overcome this type of aversion uh, and desensitization that subsequently occurs, that we may need to refresh uh, the images. Importantly, this occurred only after about three months of exposure. And if we look to other countries who do do pack rotation images, this typically occurs after oftentimes years of exposure to these things. Now, of course, the study is not uh, without its own set of limitations. Now, price estimates tend to be overstated um, in these type of tasks. Um, a little bit we're asking people to play with a kind of monopoly money might you pay this might you pay that um, and while these tasks show time and time again that they're ecologically valid it also does show that there is um, a slight overstatement here um, of course the randomized control trial study groups were not stratified by this conjoint estimate and as a result these groups are not balanced on this measure this was not what the randomized trial was um, designed to look out for its primary analysis. Um, also, uh, we're not able to estimate the impact 
among non-daily smokers, susceptible non-smokers or smokers ready to quit. We were primarily looking at individuals um, who were daily smokers um, with no quitting intentions. However, we did anchor the choices in this task to the preferred brand and the pack prices that people paid regularly, which really allowed us to focus in um, on this willingness to pay and, and not thinking about, well, you know, it's not exactly my brand, so I really might not buy that. We also exposed participants to the conjoint pack. We allowed them to handle the design for several minutes prior to the completion of the first task. We really wanted to anchor these in the real world and not just on an image on the screen. Um, and of course, they purchase their own cigarettes packaged into one of these designs for three months. Again, a strong ecological validity. And we again completed the willingness to pay assessment after this. So, in conclusion, um, US packaging generates a lot of appeal and adds value to the product. We know that graphic packaging engenders price aversion and represents a loss in the perceived value of the product, but this loss varies as a degree of the salience of warning. Now, importantly, we see this effect begin to wear out after a short three months of exposure of obtaining cigarettes in that same packaging. And this indicates a need for regular refreshment of these graphic images. Now, future studies are, of course, needed to determine whether these results translate to a hybrid style packaging. That's one under consideration by the FDA, as we think this is, would have a, a, a lessening of an impact in the US. Um, so with that said, I would like to thank my co-authors for this study, as well as the CASA study team who collected the data, the funders, and of course, the Commonwealth of Australia who um, licensed the images to us. So with that, thank you and I'd like to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone. This is a really fascinating presentation. I'd like to turn it over to uh, the floor over to our discussant, uh, C. Shang. C, please uh, proceed. Thank you. Uh, very interesting results, Matt. Um, so I guess I have two questions. Um, the first one is about the um, randomized control trials. I know you have three arms. Mm -hmm. And if I understand correctly, those people can only purchase a certain uh, stealth package uh, from you guys when they are assigned to a certain arm. I'm just wondering, how did you guys verify the compliance? Because, you know, people still can access the uh, retail market and they probably would be like, this is the graphic warning or too horrific. I just don't you know, go somewhere and buy my cigarettes. So did you guys have any mechanism to verify? Yeah, great question. So um, as part of the trial, we, um, we were conducting an ecological momentary assessment. So we had participants completing um, messages on their phone every single day. We also, because they were purchasing um, cigarettes from us, we were able to track um, their purchase patterns over time. And we saw no purchase differences across the study arms. People also self-reported um, throughout the course of the trial if they were smoking cigarettes from their study pack um, or another study pack. So it was self-report. Um, but again, we did not see any major differences um, across those. We also collected salivary coconine um, on this as well and didn't really see uh, a change in smoking behavior, but we didn't go so far as to require individual to collect their cigarette butts or anything of that nature. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, you know, it's quite, it's quite interesting that um, another question that I have regarding the design is, um, so I know that they do two choice tasks, right? So like one at baseline and the other at the, um, at the end of the intervention. And um, so they're both the adapted to adaptive uh, conjoint, conjoint analysis. Basically, I think my question is the participants are now not doing or not answering the same set of choice tasks in yeah, the great. baseline versus in, in the end, I mean, after the post-intervention. So I'm just wondering how much can you attribute the differences that you observe or you estimate to just the changes in the choice tasks versus, it's the, versus the impact of intervention? So I guess that's my question. Yeah, great question. Yeah. And one, honestly, I haven't given much thought, so I really thank you for bringing that up. Um, 
because yes, and each individual um, does receive kind of a shocked value to this choice test and this choice stat is adaptive and it kind of learns from how the individuals um, are responding. So while they were not seeing the exact same set of questions in the exact same order with the same responses, we did keep the remainder of the attribute levels um, and those consistent. Um, and we're still able to derive individual estimates um, for each of those preferences um, at each level. Um, and so we did compare across that. I think that's a, a really interesting question and probably one that's warranting a, a future study to see if, if we really lock things in and everybody completes the exact same task, um, if that's any different than if they're receiving a slightly altered task. In the literature, um, people have done this. Uh, it's not been of issue, um, but I would, I'd like to investigate that a little bit more. It's a good question. Thank you, Matt. Actually, I have another question. Um, so my last one. Um, so which is about the, the blend package. Mm -hmm. But even if it's blank, people can still see the logos, right? So they're like, oh, this is still my secrets. And I say, if I'm a Marlboro smoker, is that the case? That's the case, yeah. So we didn't match everyone's pack, both within the conjoint task, as well as the trial to their preferred brand. Um, and on the blank packs, as well as the graphic packs, it did say their preferred branding variant. So marble red, uh, marble gold, and that was on the pack. And that is, that is by design. That is how, um, at the time, Australia did that. And so the idea was to really um, look at a kind of midpoint intervention with the blank pack where we're just removing the marketing, but not necessarily adding um, the graphic warning label. But it's still, in some sense, um, it's a bit of an intervention given the drab olive color. Um, and the complete removal of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matt. I'll pass this to Catherine um, to the Q&A. Yep. Thanks so much for those great questions, I see. I now we'll just uh, look at the audience questions. We have five audience members. There's still time. If you'd like to add something, please do. Uh, we have a question from Reginald Ebert. Uh, do you have any sense about heterogeneity in terms of the desensitization of individuals exposed to these graphics? Um, I, you know, we really didn't examine more than just the individual graphic pack, but all of these estimates are um, within the individual level. Um, so we're comparing individual change here, not necessarily just an aggregate. So it's a more of a within subject change. Um, we did see um, some differences in baseline. Um, willingness to pay across various demographic characteristics. Um, however, in this particular study, pull this up, um, we didn't find any major differences or predictors of this kind of change um, across a number of different covariate controls that we included in the model. Um, the only significant difference we saw was in the blindness back for the American spirit image and happy to chat more about that um, directly if you wanna message me. Okay, great, thank you. A uh, question from uh, Rura Jacobs. Similar to Heather's questions, what do you think about the possibility of these graphic images leading to product complementarity, i.e. using alternative tobacco products to reduce the risk presented in the imagers or substitution, perhaps changing to oral nicotine, e cigs et cetera, to counter the negative affect associated with the products that have the graphic warning labels? There's a wonderful question in the study I've designed and I'm currently hoping to get funded to answer. Um, I think that it may um, push preferences into other product categories, um, particularly as we consider other FDA um, policies that may be implemented alongside these, whether that be um, flavor bans or things like reduced nicotine standards. Um, it, it's really an interesting question to think about how these policies may influence um, preferences and willingness to pay for other product categories like e-cigarettes, iQuas, um, other products of that nature. Okay. Well, we so, wish you the best of luck with that funding and we look forward to seeing your work. Thank you. you uh, just a couple more questions. Um, three more questions, one from Stanton Glantz. Isn't it correct that the wear out isn't that fast? How frequent do the replacement of graphic warning labels have to be to remain a net improvement over the status quo? Yeah, great question, um, Stan. Um, I mean, we saw it uh, happen occur within this three-month period. Now, the effect was not massive. We're talking about 
a 50 cent um, decrease here. I think it's a larger, larger question, the one we want to delve into further. I think the, the wear out component has been a little tricky to measure and truly quantify. Um, and so this was one of our attempts at trying to get at that. Now, of course, um, we are limited by budget and study design. Of course, we would love to follow these individuals um, for much longer, but uh, you know, purchasing packs for them and then selling those packs to them, et cetera, um, had a significant cost. And so uh, we would love to explore that further, but don't know the answer, unfortunately. Great question. Uh, a question from uh, Atikan um, Baritz. Uh, the, there's a thought that these are um, a fair, fair amount of money to be willing to pay to avoid being exposed to the graphic warnings. Um, that I'm wondering if there is a social break-even uh, point that that's um, might might work well. Yeah. So a, a couple thoughts. Um... A couple thoughts there, right? So we're de deriving their, their willingness to pay um, based on these estimates. But as I mentioned in the limitation, some of this is a little bit um, monopoly money in some sense. So one of the examples we like to give in the sense of you're, you know, the howls on Gilligan's Island and you're, you know, wanting to get off the island and you're, you're willing to pay a million dollars for a boat, um, you know, thinking about this scenario. But when one boat arrives and multiple boats arrive with actual price points, and these are actually in the marketplace, they are very unlikely to pay that million dollars to get off the boat. Um, and so the, the same is likely true here. So these values are, are probably a bit overestimated um, and a little bit different in reality. Um, so that's one, one piece of it. The other is there is a social component here, absolutely. Uh, and we've examined that in some of um, our work with you know, presenting um, the PACs in public and how that changes. And so um, it's very likely that these estimates um, are, are in, in the reality lesser than what we're seeing here and would largely be even um, weakened more uh, through a hybrid kind of design that still has some of the appealing product features from the tobacco industry. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Heather Salen. Um, the value, your value of your $3 price value of graphic warning labels initially, uh, we don't see a specific attenuated value afterwards. If there was a specific value, uh, what was it? Yeah, so it's not moving, kind of going back here. So this is within just the graphic pack arm itself. Um, so we see that $3 valuation difference. You can either think about it as the willingness to pay to have their own pack back or the discount needed um, to willingly purchase graphic warning. So at the baseline, this is 321 for the graphic arm. And then this falls to um, about $2.45 uh, after the end of the trial. Great, thank you. A question from our own Mike Pesco. Uh, with those high willingness to pay estimates for the old pack, it makes me wonder if people would carry old empty packs with them and throw away the new packs and carry the cigarettes in the old pack. Any evidence with graphic warning labels of people doing this? Um, so we in this study did debrief people at the end of the study and inquired a little bit about that. Uh, we did not have um, a lot of self-report on that type of behavior. And I don't think that occurs regularly in the literature. Um, it's, there's an, an inconvenience factor with that. I think on the front end, you might see some people um, putting their cigarettes into another pack or having a specific cigarette holder. But after a while, the, the images just become like any other image. And you know there's this annoyance factor. And so they just end up keeping the pack. I think what happens um, more often than not, especially if you look at other countries, you don't see, um, you see some of this going on, but not necessarily at large, you know, scale levels. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Skip Murray. Uh, being as in some locations, cigarettes display, are displayed so the packs can be seen. Is there any data on little kids, uh, toddlers through early elementary seeing such gruesome images? Would it be scary, traumatic? I'm not familiar with any images of uh, very young children um, seeing these, um, particularly displayed in public. Um, I'm uncertain how that would unfold in the US. Of course, um, there would likely be some sort of aversive response um, there. But uh, for this study, we're largely not 
evaluating that. I think that's an important question on how to present that information uh, to have the greatest you know, public health impact, but really you know, reduce any sort of shock and awe or um, negative affect amongst the real young children. Thank you. I just one more question. Thank you, audience, for all these fantastic comments and questions. This is another comment from Heather Seelan. Uh, re wear out the best warning systems such as Australia and New Zealand, rotate 12 plus warnings at a time, and try to replace them every year or two, or at least having two sets rotating over uh, two years. I guess maybe some uh, best practices from, um, uh, from various programs across the world. Yeah, agreed. And uh, we partnered and, and talked with Australia quite frequently, and um, they were really interested in the data on this to try to understand um, these wear out effects. And I think this helps support those policies for um, a large number of images and a large and a frequent rotation of set images. Thank you very much. I think we're through with it. We are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to the audience of 135 people for your participation. Have a top snatch weekend. Great, thank you all.